Welcome to the Lynch Rentals Podcast. I'm Ryan Hill. This week, Joey and I are sitting down with Nightscape and time-lapse photographer Matthew Seville. Nightscape photography, if you're unaware, is basically the art of shooting landscapes at night, but with particular interest and emphasis on stars. It's a separate field from the more scientific astrophotography, but shares many of the same challenges, like extremely low light and often very long exposure times. And optically, it's one of the most demanding types of photography imaginable. Just about any flaw in a lens is going to be more noticeable when shooting nightscapes. So we'll cover Matthew's go-to gear, how he decides what to take on a shoot, and his favorite techniques for capturing nightscapes. Matthew Seville, welcome to the Lynn Journals Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. How's it going? It's going well, going well. How are you? I am excited to be here. <laughs> we are excited to have you. Yeah, it's been, I, been for the first time in probably a year, I got eight hours of sleep last night after photographing a two day wedding that involved airplane travel. Ooh, and uh, wow. so I came home, took my uh, COVID test and then passed out. <laughs> Hell yeah. What is a two day wedding sleep. entail? Is it like, uh, are you shooting like prep on the first day or is are we talking about a wedding that is literally spread across two days well it is hindu weddings that usually go for more than one day and so sometimes they have a ceremony on one day and then a reception the next day other times they have a small pre-wedding event on one day and then another small pre-wedding event on the next day and these things can get to three or four days long depending on how uh, traditional their the Hindu culture is in terms of what different little ceremonies they're doing. It's a really beautiful overall thing. And the wedding photography studio, which is my day job, uh, specializes in cultural ceremonies of all kinds. Because in Southern California here, literally all the world cultures are represented. And that comes out in wedding photography, which been a real fun day job to see and do yeah that's very cool i i have not done a ton of wedding photography but in my very limited experience i think the only thing i liked about Mm -hmm. wedding photography is seeing you know seeing like little differences culturally between like different ceremonies and even oh yeah beyond like religion or broad culture stuff just like the little decisions everybody makes to like make their ceremony unique that's cool but yeah, we are not here to talk about wedding photography, unfortunately, as very cool as that is. We may have to have you Thankfully. back to talk about like cultural differences in wedding photography. That's a niche thing that I would actually love That's to talk cool about. Idea, but today we're talking more about landscape and specifically nightscape photography. So wedding photography is your day job. How would you describe to anyone who's unfamiliar your uh, night job, I guess we'll call it, since it's mostly yeah. That is literally what it is. I have a day job and it used to be a hobby that I kept separate as my private personal passion. But now it is literally my night job to my day job. And that is going out in the middle of the night and photographing the landscape by moonlight or starlight. And that's basically what it is. You know, people used to call it landscape astrophotography and then nightscape photography and I, however many years ago, started calling it Astro Landscape Photography, and I bought the website Astro Landscapes, and uh, slowly the term just kind of caught on a little bit. So yeah, Astro Landscape Photography, that's that's basically it. And uh, background-wise, are you pretty much self-taught, or did you, you know, receive some sort of training in photography before you got started? I did go to a local community college, Orange Coast College in Southern California that had one of the best photography programs, but that was in the days of film. So I literally learned the basic things like shutter speed and aperture on large format or film cameras in general. And that was the vast extent of my quote unquote traditional formal education. Everything else in terms of digital photography and nightscape photography, it was mostly just trial by fire and go out and take pictures and 
learn what a histogram is and learn how to focus on the stars. And that was mostly all self-taught. Yeah. And especially in the style of what you do, that's an entirely different world, uh, digital photography versus film. It's, it's, there are very many differences and many different styles. But if you were going, say, from portraiture uh, between digital and film, there may not be as huge a difference. But in your work, especially like time lapses and night astrophotography with multiple exposures, I would imagine that's a, an entirely different thing. It's actually, I feel like an entirely new thing that was largely impossible in the days of film especially when it comes to time lapse, because you can't rattle off 300 or 1,000 frames. Uh, and the low light exposure options were very limited in the days of film. So nightscape photography in general is uh, almost an entirely new realm that digital photography has unlocked in the last 10 plus years. Comparing day to night landscape photography, it's just a whole new world especially not just digital in terms of what digital cameras have made possible with the incredible high ISO performance, but also the lenses that have been coming out in the last five to 10 years are really making new things possible that were never before possible. And, you know, 10 to 15 years ago, wide angle, fast aperture lenses were almost entirely trash. That's the best way to describe them. They were just trash in terms of any, anywhere off center, your image quality was just garbage or trash. And you could not get very good quality images, even on a digital camera, compared to what we have seen in the last five to 10 years that has become possible with all of these incredibly sharp lenses. Yeah, I am curious about that. What uh, what your requirements or preferences are for lenses and how they may differ from maybe more traditional landscape photography and especially like street or portrait photography. You know, you're not you. I, I assume you would not describe yourself as an astrophotographer. That's sort of different from what you're doing. Astrophotographers are mainly taking like but sometimes deep sky level. The, yeah, deep sky, often involving telescopes, photos of stars. But your work does incorporate a lot of stars and night skies and stars are remarkably demanding optically for lenses. What makes stars a particular challenge? There's a handful of things that really change the entire uh, list of priorities for a nightscape photographer compared to any other genre of photography. Because like you said, if you're a portrait photographer, you almost completely don't care at all about the image quality in the corners of your image. Or if you're a traditional daytime landscape photographer, you're almost entirely working at f8 or f11. And all literally 100% of the lenses released in the last five to 10 years, or 99% of lenses are incredible at f8 or f11 or whatever. And you can pixel peep all you want on a 40 or 60 megapixel camera, but you're going to get great results from almost any lens. Mm -hmm. So when people ask me, what lens should I buy for this or that? It really comes down to that. Are you just a daytime landscape photographer? In which case, buy yourself an F4 zoom and good luck. Go have fun. Yep. Or if you are also a daytime landscape and a nightscape photographer, all of a sudden you're going to have to deal with do I want an f2.8 zoom? Do I want an f1.4, f1.8, f1.2 prime? And then you, once you've decided, hey, I want to photograph by starlight or moonlight, you also have to start just asking yourself, how much do I care about the corners of my images? Because you can buy almost any f1.4 prime these days, and there are a lot of affordable ones out there. Mm -hmm. And they will give you incredibly sharp images throughout most of the center of your image. And there's been a lot of very popular prime lenses that are f1.4 or f2. And they're extremely popular among nightscape photographers who are only, let's be honest, only ever going to put their photos on Instagram. Right. Mm. And, and their priorities, you know, they're just not going to pixel peep in the extreme corners of their images very much. But for myself, I really do hope to 
make large prints of my photos and at least be able to view them on a 4K or someday even an 8K display. And so I really do care about the corners of the images. And that means I have to care about things like coma and astigmatism and color fringing and the big, bad, horrible one that very few people talk about is field curvature, where you can set focus for the dead center of your frame. And on literally almost every prime lens made these days, you get amazingly sharp stars in the center of your image. Even the af cheap, affordable lenses, you focus dead center, you've got amazingly sharp images. But as soon as you go off center at the edge or the corners, it's not just poor image quality and slight fuzziness or slight uh, coma or astigmatism. It's completely out of focus stars if the lens is poorly designed or if it's just a compromise for portability's sake or affordability's sake. Right. You know, there's a lot of very small, compact, lightweight lenses out there, especially now for full frame mirrorless, which is what I'm mostly using. There's a lot of very incredible, lightweight, portable lenses, but they are a compromise. And if you pixel peep the corners, you will see either lots of coma, astigmatism, vignetting, all of things which are detrimental to nightscapes, or you'll see just completely out of focus stars, which is also a problem if you, if you drop your lens, <laughs> oh, yeah. you, you need to check the left and right edge of your frame because you may have you know, misaligned. And I'm sure a lot of uh, lens rentals blog readers will know how easy it is for the optical elements in a lens to get off center or misaligned or whatever it is. The people like to use the word decentered, but any sort of issue can cause a complete game over for your nightscape photography. Right. We've actually, uh, that's something I wanted to ask you about. We've had some complaints every once in a while. Person will get a lens and they'll notice that one side of the image is sharp and the other side isn't. When we get the lens back, it tests out fine. We put it on our rapid MTF machine, it tests out fine. We've done a lot of testing on um, not only field curvature, but like field of focus can be a little tilted one way or the other, just slightly. But there is somewhere yeah. in the middle of that range, best focus. And so finding that on a star field, it, do you have any tips for that? Like, do you use a Batinov mask or anything like that? Well, first of all, I have to apologize because that complainer is probably my friend, Sean Goble, <laughs> who, uh, <laughs> who has gone through many a lens in search of the, the holy grail, a lens that is perfectly evenly sharp in all four corners. And that's what we do is when we, when we rent a lens or we buy a lens, we immediately go out, photograph the night sky. You know, field curvature 10 feet or 5 feet away from the lens doesn't matter to us. Right. What matters is infinity focus, and that's very hard to test. Yeah. So, so we have encountered innumerable lenses where everything seems good until you focus on the stars. And then, bam, you've got a significantly softer or aberrated whatever corner edge. And uh, we return the lens or we sell it on eBay. That's why we test most of our primes on our rapid MTF machine, because it does test at infinity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's very necessary for someone who's doing nightscape photography. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why my friends and I go to lens rentals, shameless plug, is because we are that demanding in terms of how sharp a lens is at infinity, right. which very few people even understand, let alone are able to test for. Right. But you're right, like you said, I've got in the habit of just focusing a little off center, somewhere around the rule of thirds. Okay. I'll set focus for the stars and nothing fancy, no masks or other gadgets or techniques. I am a keep it simple kind of person. I go into live view since I'm from the DSLR era. Um, I go into, I call, I still call it live yeah, view. Same. I go into live <laughs> view. I, I uh, frame the focus point rule of thirds area and I magnify that live view to 100% or 200%. And I just rack focus back and forth, back and forth until I am sure what either side of in focus is. You know, you'll see the star turn into a large disc instead of a small pinpoint. Mm -hmm. And I just go back and forth and back and forth and just kind of narrow it down to the perfect sharpness 
you, because a lot of times you will not see perfect sharpness at around the rule of thirds area. And so you have to balance it out by going back and forth and seeing what out of focus is on either edge and just kind of gradually narrowing it down. And a lot of lenses, they will test in reviews to be very sharp, but then we'll test it out. And then lo and behold, there's lots of field curvature or the, the corners just have aberrations and there is no good focus point that balances it all out. Right. Just the nature of a uh, nighttime landscape. It's just extremely, yeah. extremely. It's very demanding. Uh, demanding. Yeah. Like almost anything yeah. that can be wrong with the lens is going to be no most noticeable in that exact situation. <laughs> Yeah, and that's tough. And all that said, all those, you know, demands established, uh, what are some of your go to lenses? What do you typically shoot with? Well, it all really is the bigger, the better. In some cases, the big, giant, fast aperture prime lenses that are clearly a no compromises optical approach wind up being the best in terms of low field curvature, low vignetting high acuity or whatever off center or in the corners mm -hmm. like the sigma 14 millimeter 1.8 is overall better than the new sony gm 114 1.8 when you're stopping it down to say f 2.8 again both lenses are incredibly sharp throughout most of the image frame and the sony 14 1.8 gm is probably the better lens overall because it's much more lightweight and compact for most people like i do a lot of backpacking and stuff mm -hmm. but i will go with a middle of the road compromise lens like the samyang rokinon 14 millimeter f 2.4 sp xp whatever it is mm -hmm. that is a great balance of low field curvature low coma astigmatism decently low vignetting and when you set focus correctly somewhere around the rule of thirds you get incredible sharpness across the entire image frame and there's a handful of lenses that are like that some sigma art primes some of the sony gm primes and the new canon and nikon full frame mirrorless lenses are almost all amazing all across the board mm -hmm just because Canon and Nikon are doing it right. When they finally joined the full frame mirrorless realm, they are just hitting it out of the park with almost every single one of their full frame mirrorless wide angle fast aperture lenses. And you mentioned mirrorless. Are you pretty much shooting just mirrorless uh, at this point? Have you made the switch entirely? Yeah, because as much as I love an optical viewfinder mm -hmm. for outdoor adventure, landscape, backpacking, photography, I love to be able to raise a camera to my eye, even when the camera is turned off and look through an optical viewfinder and frame the shot. That's just a wonderful overall experience when I'm out hiking and in nature. I don't want to s look at a digital screen in a tiny little viewfinder. And those things really do, those things are really killing my vision. I'm getting short sighted, that's for sure. But when it comes to nightscapes and you're doing a lot of long exposures or four hour time lapses, and also just in general, the nightscape photography demands on lens performance, the mirror, the full frame mirrorless cameras and lenses are just that much better that once you try them, there's no going back. They're just, if you get a good copy, they are that amazing. And so when it's a pound lighter and it's just as sharp or sharper, we, we go to mirrorless and we never look back. And also the other thing is when you're doing a day to night or a four hour overnight time lapse, we love that you can just plug a USB battery pack into that camera yeah. And now Sony, not just Sony, but Canon and Nikon and Fuji and Panasonic, all of those amazing systems, you plug a USB or USB PD battery into your camera and it'll run that camera all night long. That is super helpful. They're using the mirrorless, you know, short flange distance and, and for in the case of Canon and Nikon, the wide aperture opening, we're going to see a lot more lenses that use take advantage of that short flange distance and the wide mount and achieve not just amazing image quality, but also 
much more lightweight portability or a focal range that's that wasn't previously possible like the sony 12 to 24 2.8 right. is incredibly sharp and canon has a 15 to 35 2.8 that accepts 82 millimeter filters that was not possible on full frame dslrs and yet again it's incredibly sharp so what you're seeing is either a lens that's very very sharp but it's quite heavy and big in some cases or you're seeing a lens that is quite sharp not perfect but it's a incredibly lightweight and portable lens that you're like okay that's a good lens that i could take backpacking or hiking mm -hmm. for a week in the wilderness and I, it wouldn't break my back say so, so for example nikon's full frame mirrorless 14 to 24 2.8 is incredibly lightweight and compact and portable yet still very sharp incredible image quality Sigma's, all, Sigma's mirrorless 14 to 24 2.8 is also very incredibly lightweight, compact, and yet still very sharp. And on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have the Sony 20, uh, 12 to 24 2.8. That thing's a pretty heavy beast, and but it is also very, very incredibly sharp. Okay, we'll take a quick break right there, and when we come back, we'll talk about how you actually carry all this stuff out into the field. Want a discount on your next order from Lens Rentals? Head to lensrentals.com slash podcast or follow the link in the show notes for a coupon code. As the largest online photo and video equipment rental house in the world, Lens Rentals has been supplying both professionals and hobbyists for over 15 years. We carry everything from cameras and lenses to drones, computers, even VR headsets, all shipped straight to your door for whatever length of time you need. Rent the gear you need to get the shot and grab a discount at lensrentals.com slash podcast. That's lensrentals.com slash podcast. In the same way that maybe your optical needs out of a lens are a little bit higher than most other people, uh, I think probably your your weight and ergonomic concerns are, uh, you know, that's a little bit higher on the list of uh, feature needs than with most other people because uh, you are walking this stuff often miles out into the woods, which is a, a whole nother layer of complication. What do you shoot with when you need? just the lightest gear possible. Yeah, and I'll and I'll up the ante even more by saying on a lot of those trips if there's a specific special photography objective, say uh, a solar eclipse or a lunar eclipse or just the Milky Way rising perfectly over this super picturesque nightscape landscape uh, composition I will also want to bring two or three camera bodies and five or six or seven lenses, not just not just the one. And we'll plan, I'll plan a trip a year in advance and say, okay, the Milky Way is going to rise over the S curve of Reflection Canyon in Utah or whatever. And I want a uh, this focal length. And I also want that focal length. And I also want a backup of a different angle. And so I'm carrying three camera bodies or two camera bodies and three or four lenses, you know, 10 miles into the wilderness and setting it up and all hoping for the best. And so weight savings definitely factors into that. And also we can just sometimes if it's an event like the Milky Way rising or the moonlight or something, then you can give you can hike out there and just sit there for two or three nights mm -hmm. and wait for the conditions to be perfect. Other times, if it's like the solar eclipse in 2017, you got one shot. Yep. And if you if you get clouded out or if your camera goes down, then you, it's game over. You miss you spent a year planning and, and it all went south. Oh. So that's why we put two or three cameras. I think the record is usually I hike in a group of two or three and our record is a 10 or 12 cameras total, all pointed at the same exact thing. With that in mind, the overall game plan is this. Pick your main one epic camera angle that you're planning your entire trip around, and that gets the best full-frame camera mirrorless body you can get and the best lens for that particular focal length and need. And then after that, 
you bring another full frame camera with a different lens that's a little bit more lightweight, portable, maybe a compromise in corner sharpness. And then on the third camera, you bring in maybe a, a, another full frame camera with a teeny tiny lightweight 2.8 zoom or prime. You know, the Tamron 17 to 28 2.8 is so compact and lightweight throw that on an, a Sony a7R Mark III or something, and you've got a pretty lightweight second or third camera. And then if you're bringing a third or fourth camera, by that time we're getting to a teeny tiny lightweight APS-C, some of the, the Sony and Fuji and uh, now Nikon lightweight mirrorless APS-C cameras and some of their lenses are just, they weigh almost nothing. And that's what you get for a two or three or four camera setup going off into the wilderness. You just kind of you have your priorities and you kind of, after that, you kind of dwindle down and make more compromises in weight savings. Say, for example, if I was going on a backpacking trip, that's what it would be right now. The a Sony a7R 3 or a7R 4 and the Tamron 17 to 28 2.8, very lightweight, compact, full frame and then this Tamron 28 to 200, very lightweight, compact, super zoom that's still quite sharp throughout the entire range. And if I had to go on a very lightweight hiking trip that was not about photography and just about enjoying the outdoors, I would narrow it all down to something like that. What do you bring for support usually? What do you mean support? Tripods? Yeah, tripods. <laughs> for, for wilderness adventures, sometimes yeah. the support is the, uh, the Garmin with the uh, helicopter rescue button and a water filter for uh, filtering water out of mm, lakes yep. and streams. That's also a support system. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of camera support, I am 100% Slick. Okay. The, uh, the, cam the tripod company Slick, which is also the Tokina lens company and the Hoya filter company. Oh, I didn't. They're all under the same umbrella. Okay. Slick tripods. Slick. Uh, S L I K. Oh, okay. S L I K. And they are, yeah. Nobody knows about them. I, I don't. They don't pay me anything, but I always shamelessly plug them everywhere I go because they are as old as or older than they're they're old, as old as Manfrotto from the Manfrotto Bogan days. They are as old as or older than Gitzo, mm -hmm. but they were always that balance of both high-end very good quality gear and also you know you can find it at walmart or costco gear huh. so people photographers tend to focus on the latest color you know shiny red or blue or green amazon tripod when this this older brand slick has been making the same exact high quality lightweight very sturdy tripod for literally decades and so I own literally three or four slick tripods and uh, the ranges from some of their best lightweight carbon fiber ones to uh, some of their downright dirt cheap, but 1.8 pound uh, aluminum and plastic beater, as we call them, beat up tripods. Because again, I might be carrying two or three tripods into the wilderness and so Every pound counts. What I like is a tripod that is versatile if I'm doing like an everyday setup. Yeah. Where you can switch it out. You can have a flat base that makes the tripod just two pounds without a head. Or you can put a center column on. Or you can put a leveling base on. Based on whether you need a leveling base for a super big telephoto lens or whatever it is. Uh, and that's what I like for an everyday tripod. But when I'm going backpacking into the wilderness, I use the 1.9 or 2 pound slick carbon fiber tripods. They're only 250 bucks, 300 bucks. So it's really the best bang for buck in terms of quality. We touched on time lapse a little bit earlier, but I have a few like very time lapse specific questions I want to ask because it time lapse has always eluded me as a skill. I've tried it a bunch. I love your work. It looks really good. And uh, I, I don't know. I, I feel like time lapse seems and looks easier than it is in my head and on my outline. You, you have, you know, you're a part of the outline, but I made my own little notes. I put barbecue question mark next to time lapse because I, I feel <laughs> like that's the closest comparison i think time lapse is like barbecue in that it may not be 
extremely active all the time. You sort of have to set it and then let it go. <laughs> uh, let me, there's that one moment where it can all go terribly wrong. Right. Yeah, and you can't necessarily, you know, if you're shooting a wedding and you get one bad shot, a bummer, you know, take take your next shot. Time lapse, something yeah. can go wrong that can ruin the entire process. You might not even know until you're done. And it might not be fixable yeah. in the middle. Let me clarify this for our northern listeners. When we talk about barbecue, we mean cooking slow and low. Yeah, I'm not talking about grilling. Yeah, We're not talking I mean, about like grilling the kind now. of thing that you have to do overnight with a beer and just sort of sit next to your Weber, which yeah. it, that time lapse feels like <laughs> and is is scary in the same way. I've never been a great barbecue yeah. either. So, I, I don't, how generally do you approach time lapse? Um, I, I know that's a very broad question, but what are your uh, what are your thoughts? What's maybe like an internal mental checklist that you go through before you start a time lapse? Uh, yeah, I, I looked through the bullet points on the outline for this podcast, and <laughs> I'll just go down the line. You, uh, yeah, you listed out everything very, very accurately. I use mostly the same gear, and it all depends on, like I said, how much gear I'm taking. Yeah, if I'm just bringing one camera, it'll be the best lens, best camera I possibly can, uh, or a balance of weight savings. And other times, I might need to switch a 2.8 zoom out for a 1.4 or whatever prime, simply because I need a 15-second interval or a 30-second interval, and uh, the le- a 2.8 zoom is not fast enough to give me that shutter speed that can allow me to shoot at a eight or 15 second interval when I'm doing a day to night time lapse or something. Uh, but other than that small consideration for speed and shutter speed, everything's pretty much the same. And as often as possible, I'll use the built in camera intervalometer interval timer, because if the camera is static and I'm not using a motion control system, it just seems to me to be less of a hassle to just plug a USB battery into the camera to keep the camera alive all night long, and then just use the camera's built-in interval timer. They're all the cameras these days have them, and it works pretty well. As long as you set the camera settings to not go to sleep under any circumstance, then you're good to go. If I'm using a motion control system, like a simple lightweight uh, panning device, like a Serp Genie Mini or something, then I'll have to use the external intervalometer. Or if I need a, if it's a pitch dark night and I need a 60 or second or a 45 second shutter speed and a 60 second or a minute and 10 second interval, then I'll have to use an external intervalometer and use that to get that longer shutter speed while also still having uh, the interval timer. Which, by the way, that's a technical consideration when you're shooting time lapse. You can fudge it a little bit on your rule of 500 and let the stars blur a tiny bit because in the time lapse video, that gives a nicer sense of motion. But other than that, it's pretty much the same. But like you said, it can all go south very quickly. The challenge is getting to the location an hour early, setting up your camera and everything else 30 minutes before the light gets good or 45 minutes before the light gets good. Because if you are just setting up your time lapse as the light is getting good, unless your time lapse interval is one second, you're already out of luck. And it's and 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 you're at that point, you're shooting, you're shooting a time lapse just for the sake of getting a one or two good still frames. You you want to be for a lot of day to night or nightscape situations, you, your camera has to be set up and rolling or clicking 30, 40 minutes in advance of the best light. Right. And that's the big challenge. You want to be sitting there twiddling your thumbs, enjoying the view when the epic, beautiful light t- finally comes around. Yeah. And that is the most, I don't know, demanding and difficult time-lapse situation is what you're describing the a a day to night or night to day anytime you're you're going through a pretty heavy transition in light level how do you account for that that is a highly contended uh debate in the time-lapse world whether you use what is called the holy grail technique and manually bump your shutter speed up and down you're literally sitting there looking at your histogram and adjusting your shutter speed 
every two or three clicks manually. Or if your camera can meter in very low light, you can get away with just setting it in aperture priority and making sure your shutter speed doesn't go longer than your time lapse interval, which has menu options now for pretty much all the cameras, I think. Mm -hmm. So that if you have a 15 second interval and your shutter speed gets to 15 seconds, the camera is smart and it'll actually cut off your shutter speed at you know 14.9 seconds or something like that so that you get your 15 second interval. I'm not sure how that works, but it's something along those lines. But yeah, that that's a very, I, I do both ways. It's It works both ways and it depends on the camera. Personally, my favorite way to do it is to use aperture priority for most of the time lapse, but then right when it gets down to that nearly pitch dark nightscapes situation, you switch the camera to manual and then you force it to whatever exposure you want it at. Say ISO 6400, F1.8, and 15 seconds or whatever your exposure is. You can do that if your exposure is 15 seconds and your interval is 30 seconds, because then you have 15 seconds in between the exposure ending and the next exposure starting to check your histogram and adjust the exposure, switch from aperture priority to manual, or, or from manual to aperture priority. But yeah, a lot of the cameras these days, if they're in aperture priority with auto ISO turned on and smooth exposure ramping, you can get a very smooth day to night transition. And a lot, I think even the cameras will use teeny tiny like tenth of a stop increments in the ISO, which is really smooth. And that's a great way to do it. Auto ISO and aperture priority. When it comes to post-processing, once all this is done and you're home, are, are you just taking everything, like exporting an MOV out of Lightroom, or do you use any specialized software? How do you uh, post-process all this? That is all dependent on the how it was captured. Mm -hmm. Everything usually goes into either Lightroom or I am a big fan of Capture One, just because I like the uh, colors overall that Capture One offers. And also, when you're doing a, if you're ever doing a nightscape, star trail and you want to do a single exposure that is 15 minutes long or 30 minutes long capture one actually has an incredible long exposure noise reduction it just magically vanishes all of those uh dot noises i forget what it's called the technical term for christmas light i call it christmas light noise and that just uh, name is kind of stuck in my head i know what you mean yeah that's a good long exposure noise reduction is a setting in camera and I stopped using that years ago when I found Capture One because Capture One's noise reduction uh, system works incredibly well. But most of the time, I am stuck using Lightroom or Adobe Bridge because it's the program that integrates with the time-lapse program LR Time-lapse, which is how you do smooth transitions whenever you adjust your exposure by even a third of a stop that shows up in a final time lapse as a terrible bump of flicker of the exposure. And so you need a way to extremely smoothly ramp those exposures, whether you're doing it a third of a stop increments or let alone if you're bumping your exposure by a whole stop, because the camera can handle it, especially if you're at ISO 100, uh, doing a, a one stop boost of your exposure in post-production, you're still getting pretty perfect results. But you use the program LR Time Lapse to create a perfectly smooth exposure compensation in post production such that you adjusted your exposure by a third of a stop shutter speed or whatever, and then it'll ramp that exposure in tenth of a stop or a hundredth of a stop or whatever it is, teeny tiny little in increments, so that you get a beautifully smooth day to night time lapse. Then you export all of those raw files as JPEG frames, either 4K or 8K, and put that onto your video software timeline. We'll link out to uh, a few of your time lapses too, because they really they really do look great. And it it makes it look a lot easier than it is. <laughs> That's how like the the trends <laughs> day to night are especially uh, especially smooth. And I know how hard that can be. Oh, yeah. And there, there are all manner of sins and, and mistakes that are swept under the rug in a lot of those videos, time lapse videos on my YouTube, where 
I came so close to completely botching the entire thing. And if you look closely, you can see the highlights clip a tiny bit or the noise get crazy for a split second. But again, you're recording minutes or hours of exposures for just one second or two seconds of time lapse final result. So thankfully, if you're not too discerning or if you're just watching it on YouTube on your phone, it looks gorgeous. And the, the smooth transition of day to night is definitely one of the most challenging, but exciting and fun things to accomplish. Well, uh, thank you so much for joining us, Matthew. I really, I really appreciate it. It was fun. Thank you so much for having me. I'll uh, talk to you all again soon. Yeah, sounds awesome. Thanks for listening to the Lynch Rentals podcast. Matthew's work can be found at matthewseville.com, and his blog and detailed lens tests are at astro-photography.com. He's also written a handful of great articles for the Lens Rentals blog, so we'll link to all of that in the show notes. I'll say he has a particularly cool set of articles about testing low light metering using an integrating sphere. If that means nothing to you, check it out and learn something. We'll even throw in a separate link to those. As always, make sure to visit lensrentals.com slash podcast for a discount on your next order from us. If you're enjoying the show, you can support it by subscribing and giving us a review on Apple Podcasts. We're on Instagram and Twitter at Lens Rentals, and thanks to Jacques Granger for our theme music. More of his work can be found at revengebodymemphis.bandcamp.com. On the next episode of the Lunch Rentals podcast, I'll be talking with animator, cinematographer, and director Julie Jackson. I actually worked for Julie recently as the second AC on their upcoming short film, Delta. We'll talk about how to shoot a short with a small crew, and I'll find out if I was any help at all on the next episode of the Lunch Rentals podcast. <laughs>